Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, you know the one, Liv. So, last week, I finally covered the Amazons. But I left you hanging. Today, we are diving back in to one of the last surviving stories of a woman who was explicitly an Amazon. Penthesilea. But first, have you ordered my book yet? Yes, I'm still talking about it. Because guess what? It sold super well because all of you incredible people, and I'm on some bestseller lists, including number one at Monroe's Books, which is the local shop here. And frankly, nothing has ever been cooler. So a reminder, you can still get signed books from Monroe's, and they do ship worldwide. It can be a little pricey, though. All copies from Monroe's are signed, but if you want it personalized, there's a place on the order screen where you can request me to make it out to a specific name, monroebooks.com, M-U-N-R-O books.com. The link's in the description. The book is also available in audio, so you can listen to more of my voice wherever you get your audiobooks. But enough about that. Today, we're going all the way back to the Trojan War. This is episode 120, Peerless Penthesilea and the Horror of Achilles. Oh, the Trojan War. What a mess, am I right? Villages slaughtered, women abducted and enslaved, passed around a camp of soldiers. And those are the people we're supposed to be rooting for? One thing I love about the Iliad and that telling of the Trojan War is that we really aren't meant to be rooting for the Greeks, even if they are the stars of the show. They're monsters, and they're portrayed as such. Ten years of war just because a king was slighted when his wife was abducted, or possibly even left on her own? If she was abducted, which I personally do think is the most likely, it's not as though this was a rare occurrence. It's the crux of so, so, so many Greek myths. So in all likelihood, Menelaus wasn't actually concerned with Helen's well-being at all. He was concerned with his damaged reputation, because he was a king who allowed his wife to be abducted by a foreign prince, a non-Greek, or rather, not an Achaean, as the Homeric terminology would go. The war between the Greeks and the Trojans was an absolute shit show. Can you imagine being camped out on a beach for ten years Spending that time, sure, periodically actually warring with this city you've come to invade, but primarily just sailing around or traveling on foot to nearby cities and towns not within the walls of Troy, sacking them and killing or enslaving every single human in the city? Because that is essentially what Achilles and many and many of the other Greeks did with those ten years. The Iliad picks up nine years in and basically says as much. That's where Achilles got poor Perseus, after all. She was a woman just minding her own fucking business in her nearby town, not protected by walls like that of Troy proper, and so she and everyone else in her town was either killed or abducted and enslaved. Sing muse of the so-called heroes of the Trojan War. This is all a prelude, a reminder of what the Trojan War was all about, what it entailed. It was pointless, horrific violence through and through. Though, I'll admit, it makes for an incredible story, and the Iliad is an absolute masterpiece of ancient literature. But the war itself? Just a bloody, awful mess. And it reached its pinnacle of violence after the death of Patroclus. That's when Achilles, the strongest, the so-called best of the Greeks, really found his stride when it comes to committing atrocities. Most famously, Achilles took it upon himself to kill Hector in return for Hector's killing of Patroclus, And boy, did he kill Hector. The ramifications of that, the king Priam sneaking into the Greek camp and begging for his son's body back, is basically how the Iliad ends. But it's not how the Trojan War ends. 
There were a number of epic poems that told the story up until the Iliad and from the Iliad onward. The Ethiopis carried the story from immediately after the end of the Iliad. The so-called Little Italy was another, the Iliopersis, or the Sack of Ilium, which is another word for Troy, among others. Of course, they are all lost. But they were written contemporaneously with Homer. So there were countless epics that told this whole story from start to finish. We just only have the two. But they weren't lost to other ancient sources who came hundreds and hundreds of years later, or in the case of Quintus, over a thousand years later. Quintus Smyrnaeus, or sometimes I've just seen him called Quintus, wrote The Fall of Troy, based on those other epics from the time of Homer. So while those original epics from the 8th century BC-ish are lost to us, we have Quintus Smyrnaeus' story to give us all a sense of what those epics might have been about. Have I mentioned lately how fucking fascinating things like this are? I don't know if anecdotes like this blow other people's minds like they do mine, but seriously, I'm just utterly obsessed with those intricacies of what we have and what we don't have. Anyway, (laughs) the details of the story of Penthesilea and her encounter with Achilles come to us from the fall of Troy but they were also as ancient as Homer's epics themselves. After Achilles has killed Hector, after he's pulled the hero's body along the sandy earth, dragged by a chariot in a show of absolute disdain for the dead and for the Trojans as a people, backup arrives for Troy and for King Priam, in the form of Penthesilea, an Amazonian princess or queen who's trying to make amends for causing the accidental death of her sister, Hippolyta. She's not alone, obviously, but she is the star of the show. Penthesilea is accompanied by 12 other Amazonian women, all ready for the battle ahead of them. These 12 women were warriors in their own right and handmaids to Penthesilea, because, quote, As when in the broad sky amidst the stars the moon rides over all preeminent, when through the thunderclouds the cleaving heavens open, when sleep the fury-breathing winds, so peerless was she amid that charging host. Penthesilea and the Amazons rode to Troy in all their glory, and at their arrival the Trojans absolutely marveled at these incredible women who had come to their rescue. Quote, To right, to left, from all sides hurrying thronged the Trojans, great marveling when they saw the tireless war god's child, the mailed maid, like to the blessed gods, for in her face glowed beauty glorious and terrible. Her smile was ravishing, beneath her brows her love enkindling eyes shone like to stars, and with the crimson rose of shamefastness bright were her cheeks, and mantled over them unearthly grace with battle prowess clad. Anyway, yeah, I'm a bit obsessed with Quintus's description of Penthesilea, and this translation is in the public domain, so we're gonna really rock it with the quotes here. Maybe this will even be a future reading series. In essence, jaws fucking dropped when Penthesilea rides with her Amazons into Troy. Not only are these women ready for war, prepared for all it has to offer, but they're fucking magnificent. Penthesilea is a daughter of Ares, and everything about her conveys that fact. She is ready to fucking fight. Ready to fight the so-called best of the Greeks. It's just too bad Achilles doesn't fight fair. At her arrival, along with the other Amazons, the Trojans find their confidence renewed. They've been so beaten down for so long, hit hard by not just this ten-year war and all the destruction caused by it, but so recently they've lost their prince, the best of them, the most valiant and brave, 
their savior, Hector. He's gone and was brought low by Achilles. Achilles has shown his true colors in the death of Patroclus. He's shown that while he might be best in battle, unbeatable, it seems he doesn't have much honor. So thank fucking God for these Amazons, because the Trojans really did feel like it might be over for them with the death of Hector, that their time had come. But with the arrival of Penthesilea, their time was held back just a little longer. Penthesilea was confident, too confident, according to Andromache, Hector's so recently widowed wife. Penthesilea arrived in Troy, certain that she alone could bring them victory, that she could defeat Achilles with ease, and bring the battle all the way to the Greek ships. Andromache, though, had so recently seen what Achilles could do. She'd seen what he did to her husband, how he treated the man she loved, and she knew that Penthesilea was in real trouble. Penthesilea and the Amazons spent the night in Troy before going to battle in the morning. That night, Penthesilea had a dream. Now, the details of the dream I'm finding a bit conflicting. According to the translation of Fall of Troy that I'm reading, the dream is sent by Athena to give Penthesilea confidence in her battle against the Greeks, but also dispel her doom. Whereas Adrian Mayer's incredible Amazons book says she had a dream sent by her father, Ares. Regardless, though, the woman has a dream sent by a god about her impending battle against the Greeks and Achilles, specifically. And the next day, she prepares. In yet another show of just how impressive this warrior woman is, Quintus gives us a full telling of her armor and her weapons, something usually reserved for heroes alone. And yes, it's amazing, and I'm going to quote it. Then did she array her shoulders in those wondrous fashioned arms given her of the war god. First she laid beneath her silver gleaming knees the greaves, fashioned of gold, close clipping the strong limbs. Her rainbow radiant corslet clasped she then about her, and around her shoulders slung with glory in her heart the massy brand whose shining length was in a scabbard sheathed of ivory and silver. Next her shield unearthly splendid caught she up, whose rim swelled like the young moon's arching chariot rail, when high o'er ocean's fathomless flowing stream she rises, with the space half filled with light betwixt her bowing horns, so did it shine unutterably fair. Then on her head she settled the bright helmet overstreamed with a wild mane of golden glistening hairs. So stood she, lapped about with flaming mail, in semblance like the lightning, which the might, the never-wearied might of Zeus, to earth hurleth, what time he showeth forth to men fury of thunderous roaring rain, or swoop resistless of his shouting host of winds. I promise that's the longest one. Next, her weapons. Not only was she equipped with javelins, but also a very special weapon. A double-edged axe, quote, which terrible Eris gave to Ares' child to be her titan weapon in the strife that raveneth souls of men. Hell fucking yes. Penthesilea, along with her Amazonian women and the men of Troy, rode confidently into battle against the Greeks. She was ready, confident, prepared to take down the best of the Achaeans, Achilles himself. She rode into battle on her precious horse, Thracian, where the best war horses came from, a horse, quote, whose flying feet could match the harpy's wings. On this incredible horse, Penthesilea rode into battle against the Greeks. Meanwhile, Priam watched from the walls of Troy. 
He called up to Zeus, praying to the king of the gods that Penthesilea prevail against the Greeks. She is your own kin, he reminded Zeus. And Zeus does give Priam a sign once his prayers are finished, but it isn't a good one. Priam sees an eagle fly overhead, holding a dove in its talons, a sign that Penthesilea will fall there on the plains before Troy. Still, it isn't over yet. Penthesilea and the others ride towards the Greeks, surprising them. They weren't expecting the Trojans to come at them in this way. But even more so, they weren't expecting these warrior women who rode their horses like they were another limb. The Greeks scrambled to get themselves together to be ready for this onslaught by these 13 absolute fucking badasses. They weren't so unprepared that they couldn't get their shit together, and before long, the Amazonian women and the Trojans with them clashed with the Greeks there between Troy and the Greek camps. Weapons clanged, blood was spilled, cries rang out as people on both sides of the battle were taken out. Penthesilea began the battle with a bang, taking out eight of the Greek warriors that she encountered— Cloney, one of her Amazonians, killed another, but she fell shortly after. Three other Amazons fight while taking out Greeks before they themselves fall. As the battle continues, more Amazons fall to the Greeks, though not before they can do their own damage. Amazons fall to the Greeks all around her, but Penthesilea continues on. She is a fucking powerhouse in her battle with the Greeks. She takes out countless of them, with some help from the Trojans. She's described as a lioness as she pounces upon the Greeks that she encounters. Finally, though, she's done enough damage and has yet to encounter who she knows to be the best the Greeks have— She's eager to prove herself against their best heroes. She's thirsty for their blood. Penthesilea's motivations aren't delved into too deeply, but that she accidentally killed her sister and is seeking to purify herself can be seen as her major motivation. She is full of trauma and fury, and she's looking for a place to let out those feelings in a way that she feels is productive. Killing those fucking Greeks. Where is Ajax, she calls out, and Achilles, where is he? She taunts the Greeks, calling for their best heroes to join her so that she can kill them, just as she's done with the rest of the Greeks she's encountered. These calls for the famous heroes to come and fight her only fill Penthesilea with more resolve. She continues taking out any and all of the Greeks she comes across, spilling so very, very much blood. In this epic, Penthesilea is described as any other Greek hero would be. Just as Hector or Achilles is described in the Iliad, Penthesilea is described here in the fall of Troy. It isn't a big deal that she's a woman, she just is one, and at the same time, she is the best hero the Trojans have fighting for them, now that Hector is no longer. She is a hero, a warrior, the most feared of all the Trojan allies. And all the while, Achilles and Ajax lie by Patroclus' grave, mourning him and staying out of the battle between the Greeks and the Trojans, held back by some godly intervention. But there is a group of people watching Penthesilea closely, watching as she absolutely decimates the Greeks, as she rains havoc on them just as Hector once had. The women of Troy watch from the walls, marveling at Penthesilea, One of them, Tisiphone in the translation I'm reading, Hippodamia and Adrian Mayer, calls to the other Trojan women. She says, in essence, look, we women are just as prepared as the men to fight for our city. We've seen so much death, so many of our brothers, sons, husbands killed in this war. We are just as Trojan as any of them. She urges the Trojan women to join her in taking up arms against the Greeks in defense of their city. She's convincing, too, making a perfect argument for why these women should go on into battle. As a result, as the women listen to this speech, quote, The weaving wool, the distaff, far they flung, and to grim weapons stretched their eager hands. But, 
she's cut short by an older woman, Theano, who agrees with much of Hippodamia's speech to the women of Troy. But Theano is there with a bit more information. She agrees that the women of Troy are just as capable as the men, but that unlike these warrior women of the Amazons, they lack the training and the learned skills. It's a fascinating conversation between these two, basically the premise being, yes, women are equal to men and are fully capable of being this level of badass. It's just that they're not trained to be that way, at least outside of the Amazonian culture that they're now witnessing. So, she says, these Trojan women shouldn't grab weapons and race out onto the battlefield because they will surely be defeated, but not because they couldn't do it just that they weren't ready. Adrian Mayer notes, quote, The long speeches of Hippodamia and Theano express the ancient belief that, with the right training and practice, women do possess the spirit and physical capacity to become warriors. Back on the battlefield, Penthesilea continues her onslaught against the Greeks. The earth is stained with their blood. So, so much of their blood. It's a real mess. She's fucking deadly. She continues, along with her remaining Amazons and whatever Trojans are with them, killing Greek after Greek, pushing them farther and farther back, closer and closer to their ships. Finally, they're pushed so far back that they're close enough to the Greek camp that the din of the battle reaches Ajax and Achilles where they mourn Patroclus. Ajax hears it first, and he points it out to Achilles. We wouldn't look very good if we allowed the Trojans to reach our camp, to set fire to our ships, Ajax points out. He's definitely worried mostly for his own heroism, bringing up Heracles, who had sacked Troy long before, and how they wouldn't look good by comparison if they didn't join the rest of the Greeks on the battlefield now. So they do, whether for heroic or egotistical reasons, they do. They finally join the Greeks against Penthesilea, exactly what she wanted. But this is Achilles. The best of the Greeks, he without mercy. It isn't long before Achilles has taken out Penthesilea's four remaining Amazonian women. Unsurprisingly, this makes Penthesilea pretty angry. It only spurs on her desire to fight Achilles hand to hand, to take him out herself, and in the most bloody and violent way she can imagine. She sees Achilles from afar, after he's killed her friends and sisters, and flies toward him with incredible speed. She is ready, she is full of adrenaline and fury and hatred for this man who not only killed the last of her Amazonian allies, but who also represents all the hurt and trauma that she has within herself. She flies at Achilles and throws her spear at him. She hits him straight on, but if you remember from the Iliad, Achilles has very special armor, a very special shield. More recently, this is mirrored in the armor and shield of Aeneas in the Aeneid. Both their armor was forged by Hephaestus, the god of fire and the forge, and basically the guy to go to if you want completely impenetrable armor. Which is what this is. So while Penthesilea's spear hits Achilles straight on, instead of piercing his armor or his shield, it shatters on it, breaking apart uselessly. Furious, Penthesilea throws her other spear at Ajax instead, but it too glances off his armor without doing any damage. Quintus reminds us that Ajax isn't meant to be pierced by any enemy weapon in this war. Enemy weapon. Still, this is enough for Ajax to decide to leave Penthesilea to Achilles alone. He turns to go up against the Trojans in place of the Amazonian queen, Achilles can handle her, he thinks, as he leaves. With Ajax gone, Achilles and Penthesilea face off. And here, from Achilles, we get the first real insult based in Penthesilea being a woman. He mocks her for thinking a woman could defeat him, or even Ajax. It's noted, and he uses the word woman, but it isn't too pointed. 
He still respects her abilities, just not her abilities against him. I wish he was wrong. The moment he's finished his little speech, Achilles throws his spear, made by Chiron himself, at Penthesilea, and it pierces under her shoulder, causing her arm to lose feeling and drop her precious battle axe. Blood pours from her wound, but she remains, for now, on her horse. As her mind begins to cloud over, Penthesilea considers her options— Should she try to regain her strength to withdraw another weapon and fight Achilles hand-to-hand, or should she get off her horse and plead for her own life? She doesn't have much time to consider, though, because Achilles comes right back at her, throwing another spear at the Amazonian badass. This time, it's a powerful enough throw that it pierces through not only Penthesilea, but first runs all the way through her precious horse. The pair fall, together, to the dusty earth on the plains of Troy, as Penthesilea gasps out some of her final breaths. Seeing Penthesilea fallen, the Trojans feel a ripple of fear pass through their ranks. Yet again, their most important, impressive, and strong warrior has fallen to this monster of a human, Achilles. They mourn her, and many of them flee back toward the city of Troy. Achilles, though, laughs over her body. It wasn't the gods who gave you this idea to come up against me, he says, adding, quote, It was the darkness shrouded fates and thine own folly of soul that pricked thee on to leave the works of women and to fare to war, from which strong men shrink shuddering back. Again, the gender-related bullshit that we get here is from Achilles, fucking asshole. And then, well, then Achilles removes Penthesilea's helmet and the other Greeks crowd around her body. And now, well, now they marvel over, yes, a woman there dead on the ground. And isn't she gorgeous? Achilles feels a little bad about the whole thing now, but not really. He just kind of regrets killing her instead of, you know, abducting her and bringing her back to Greece so he could marry her because she sure is pretty yes now that she doesn't have her helmet the greeks crowd over penthesilea's body this warrior woman who's just killed so so many of them and they talk about how hot she was and isn't it a shame that this smoke show is dead it's revolting meanwhile Ares has watched all of this happen He's watched Achilles kill his daughter in the most horrifying manner and then proceed to disrespect her even in death. Ares, the god of war and mayhem, is not happy. In fact, he's prepared to rain down his horror and his anger over the Greeks when he's stopped by Zeus, who sends an angry bout of thunder, reminding Ares who's boss and to not get involved. Unfortunately, Ares must listen, and he remains out of the fray. As Achilles continues to look upon the body of Penthesilea, we're told, quote, Over Peleus' son gazed, wild with all regret, still gazed on her, the strong, the beautiful, laid in the dust, and all his heart was wrung, was broken down with sorrowing love, deep, strong, as he had known when that beloved friend Patroclus had died. Achilles is actually proposing that he loves Penthesilea now after seeing her helmet removed as much as he loved Patroclus when he died. He's experiencing battle lust in the form of literal lust and seems to believe that that means he loved her. Anyway, I know everyone loves Achilles because of Patroclus and Achilles and Song of Achilles, but just a reminder that unfortunately that story is not entirely factual and Achilles is actually an enormous piece of shit that absolutely didn't deserve Patroclus as a friend or lover. And also in the ancient sources, Patroclus isn't a saint either. I'm just still partial to him because of Song of Achilles too. One of the Greeks watching this, Thersites, begins to jeer Achilles for what he sees as weakness, the way the man mourns the death of the Amazon. But I mean, who thinks it's a good idea to jeer at Achilles? Because anyway, he kills Thersites right there and everyone's pretty okay with it. If I recall, Thersites has been obnoxious before. 
Adrian Mayer notes that this act by Achilles falling in love, in a way, with Penthesilea after he's killed her, was a common archetype in these types of epic works of poetry and mythology. That it was depicted often in pottery and paintings, Achilles tenderly holding up her body in death, or even the moment their eyes meet after he's already thrown that final spear. Now we find it disturbing, but then it was a show of her heroism as much as it was also about his. She had died a heroic death, and Achilles was honoring that in his own creepy way. In Quintus's telling of this story, from here the Greeks give up Penthesilea's body and even her armor to the Trojans, who hold a funeral for her that was fitting for her accomplishments, her importance, her heroism. They build her an epic funeral pyre and burn her body alongside her horse. Then they bury her ashes amongst Trojan kings, along with her armor. But there are other versions. They involve necrophilia, or the accusation of it, but frankly, they don't seem particularly well-rooted in ancient sources, save for a passing reference, so we're not going there. Penthesilea doesn't deserve that. Penthesilea's name means mourned by men. Adrian Mayer adds, quote, Perhaps it is no coincidence that Achilles' name also carries an ambiguous connotation of pain, grief, suffering. And like Penthesilea, Achilles also experiences personal grief and causes great mourning. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. I'm thrilled to have finally told the story of all the Amazons of mythology, especially this one. I actually didn't expect it to be what it became as I was reading Fall of Troy. So I hope you really enjoyed it because this was really fun. Of course, stay tuned as eventually I do want to talk about the Amazons historically because I think it's so important that these mythological ideals of women were actually based in historical cultures of the region. But again, holy research. Speaking of, a huge thank you to Jade, a listener who has helped put together some of today's research for me. She has been an immense help and has prepared other bits of research for future episodes. Enormous thank you, Jade. Today's episode is almost entirely from Quintus's Fall of Troy and Adrian Mayer's book, Amazons, Lives and Legends of Warrior Women Across the Ancient World. Unless I reference Mayer specifically, all quotes are direct from Fall of Troy. And another big thank you to everyone who's bought my book. I honestly can't believe so many of you have, and it is definitely the coolest thing to ever happen to me. It also hopefully means I will get the opportunity to publish more books, a more detailed mythology book, more in the voice of this podcast, and my novel, maybe eventually, whenever I find the time to actually finish it. Ah, uh, what's time? Anyway, truly rambling now. Thank you all so much for being around, for listening, you know, for all of it. I am Liv, and I truly love this shit so damn much. <laughs>